Hello, everyone, and welcome to Voices, a library lecture series. We'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that we are gathered on the sacred homelands of the Mahikiniak or Mohican people who are the stewards of this land. Today, the community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Munsee Mohican Nation. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present. Voices presents speakers on timely and enduring issues to broaden and enrich the scope of studies at Hudson Valley Community College. Please fill out a survey at the link on our first slide. These help to inform our future programming. Today, Voices presents Emily Curo. Emily is Executive Director for the Troy Foundry Theater, a graduate of Russell Sage College, and she holds an MFA in Theater Management from Florida State University. Her previous work includes several years with the Williamstown Theater Festival and the Academy of Music Theater in Northampton, Massachusetts. She believes the arts are an integral part of how we form communities, how we perceive and communicate with the world around us and each other. Please welcome Emily Kiro. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much to HBCC Library for having me today. I'm very excited to talk to you about a whole slew of things, um, but most importantly, a new era of theater. Uh, as Anne said, my name is Emily Curro. I am the co-founder and producing executive director of Troy Foundry Theater. We are a 501c3 not-for-profit theater company based in Troy, New York. Uh, before we dive in, I'm gonna just talk about the things that we're gonna cover today. We're gonna talk about why we started a theater company. We're gonna talk about the Troy Foundry mission, vision, and our company and the span of programming since our launch in October 2017 to 2019, right before COVID-19 hit. We're gonna talk about how we get everything done. We're gonna talk about our desire to devote ourselves to our community, the community that we serve. We're gonna talk about the responsibility of arts organizations during times of political and social chaos. We will definitely touch on the COVID-19 epidemic and how that has changed theater forever as we know it. And we will end with a discussion about looking to the future and what that means for nonprofit theater companies. So why did we start a theater company? I'll start by explaining that uh, my artistic director and I, David Gerard, had planned for many years to start a theater company once we felt ready. Uh, we were both in graduate school uh, at the same time, him at Temple University for directing and me at Florida State for my MFA in theater management. When we both graduated successfully, we took some time to work in the world and um, I went to the Williamstown Theater Festival. When I left that job, we decided it was time to start Troy Foundry Theater. So who were we? We decided that we wanted to work with a group of people who were dedicated to building and lifting up the city of Troy, New York through the arts. That was very important to us. We were dedicated to the city of Troy. In 2017 and still today, 90% of our artistic staff and our company members are graduates of the Russell Sage Theater Program. Uh, a lot of our roots come from that program and from those mentors, and that was also really important to us. Uh, the rest of our company are also professional theater artists, born and raised and living in the Capital Region. We were excited about the idea of building a professional, non-traditional company. We were interested in innovative creations of devised theater from the ground up, and I'll get into what device theater is in just a moment. Uh, but we were also very excited about utilizing different art forms from multiple disciplines. We were inspired also by the idea of raising attention to social injustice and inequality through our work. We were inspired by theater companies already in, in existence, like Tectonic Theater Project and Diecast Theater of Philadelphia, as well as Frantic Assembly. All of these companies were doing physical devised theater work that inspired us. We also knew that we weren't satisfied with how theater companies that were established and had a long standing reputation were currently running things. And so before launching, we gathered the people that we wanted to work with and we created our nonprofit mission. 
Our mission is to explore the social issues of today by collaborating with a variety of artists from multiple disciplines to produce and perform new work and reinterpreted classics through a means of new, devised and immersive performances. We strive to create theater that is unique, innovative and equal. Our vision was of being a self-sustaining not-for-profit theater company in the capital region. We wanted to be a theater that towed the line between artistic disciplines and its forms. We wanted to be a theater that was unsettling and asked big questions. We wanted to be a theater that addressed problems and issues in the community, and a theater that connected and strengthened the community that we wanted to serve. And so we worked towards a launch. Our first production in October of 2017 uh, was a play called New World Order, six short plays by Harold Pinter. Uh, in an, a rather un, uh, surprising move, uh, the Harold Pinter estate allowed us the rights and the royalties to produce these short pieces uh, in any format that we wanted, in any order that we wanted, and so uh, we began the devising process. And when I say devising, I mean theater that is not created from a script that is necessarily already in existence, or we are taking a script that is already in existence and turning it on its head and changing its form. Often when we devise work, we start with themes rather than content, and we build from there. And so uh, New World Order opens. Uh, we started our company, uh, this is a shot from a rehearsal scene at Russell Sage College. We had very few resources. Uh, we started with a, um, a lovely, incredible seed donation from one of our company members, John Romeo. And without it, we could not have launched off the ground. We found the support of colleges and institutions during this time uh, to be extremely helpful. Russell Sage College provided us the luxury of an incubator year. They provided rehearsal and performance space and resources to help us get off the ground. It was also very important for us to launch our company with actors who understood what we wanted to do. It was also important for us to burst onto the scene with a clear and undeniable aesthetic and purpose as a theater company. So here are a few scenes from our first production um, the tall lighted instrument was our one and only set piece that we could afford. Uh, this, these production photos were from the Little Theater, the James L. Little Theater at Russell Sage College, uh, but we also performed the show at Hangar on the Hudson in Troy, New York. The piece itself was dark. Uh, it discussed uh, what it was like to live in a place where you do not have control over your environment and how to escape and or not escape from those places, living under autonomy. As we moved forward, we had the opportunity to work with the wonderful and amazing creator, Brenna Geffers of Die Cast Theater in Philadelphia. She came to Troy, New York, and we commissioned them to do a piece called La Ronde at Freer House on 2nd Street in Troy, New York. As you'll notice as I move through my um, presentation, so far, all of our performances have been in different locations. That's what I mean when I say site-specific. We decide to produce in a different location every time, and often that location is intrinsically linked to the story that we create. It becomes a character. And so this is a news piece from our second play, Laurent's, to be staged at Freer House in Troy, New York. And we learned so much uh, from working with Diecast on that first production. And this is around the time where the community started to identify us as very different, very bold, and uh, doing new and innovative work. It's another production still from Laurent in Freer House. Another photo with a quote from a review from the Daily Gazette. Here you can see the words that they start to use, unique, extraordinary, the other main program that we launched with in 2017 was our Dark Day Mondays free reading series. This initiative supported new work and gave playwrights a chance to see their pieces performed by professionals in a creative setting with a workshop element. This type of work is extremely helpful for new playwrights to see and hear 
their new pieces of work up on its feet. This program was highly successful. We met many new playwrights that we decided to keep working with through the process of our company. We also learned a lot about our audience by launching this series. They were interested in getting cerebral and diving into discussion, and they liked our tendency to explore the end of the world theater, as I like to call it. This series was our first real way of embedding into the community with free programming in different locations all throughout that was accessible to most. In another unprecedented approval, we received permission from the Samuel Beckett estate to create a show called Catastrophe Carnival, an evening of Beckett shorts. The photos that you see are of us building the sets, and the one with all of the tents was one performance with audience. We took, again, short pieces of Samuel Beckett's work, and we mishmatched them and created them in a new way in the setting of a theater carnival. Each tent had a different piece of performance and the audience moved from tent to tent to see each different performance. In the center was the main piece performed by actor John Romeo. This was the biggest cast and the biggest group of designers and artists that we had worked with yet. It was massive. Here are a few stills from that production. The quote in the center there is something that we had been striving for, and although we tend to not take too much uh, away from reviews and reviewers, this is one quote that stood with me. Among the remarkable things about Troy Foundry is how the company, which has been performing work for less than a year, exploded into existence with its aesthetic fully formed, one of those goals that we had been striving to reach. So we were now really starting to dive into this idea of building work as a company. We did another co-production with Die Cast Theater of Philadelphia and we created what we called the Prohibition Project, Ilium Was. This was also a devised piece of site-specific theater that took place at Colorworks Gallery in Troy and it centered around the history of prohibition in the city of Troy and in Rensselaer County. This was our first production with Colorworks Gallery, and it would prove to be a long-standing and extremely important relationship for Troy Foundry, and would provide the experience for our first in-house artist residency later that year. And there's another production still from the Prohibition Project, and another. Our next main stage production and our first equity production with an equity contract was the play 100 Years by well-known playwright Richard Dresser. Richard Dresser actually submitted his new play to us through the Dark Day Monday free reading series. We did a reading of it and the next year we were given permission to produce that world premiere of his play. Uh, this was the first production that we faced a lot of uh, challenges on, um, one of those being low audience attendance. One of the reasons that we possibly found for this was that we performed the piece in the Social Security Building in Troy. This could have been a barrier for attendance for certain elements of our audience. Uh, but we continued to push forward and to produce theater in unusual locations because we felt it was important. In 2019, we created a piece uh, actually, we co-produced, excuse me, a piece created by Charlie Del Marcel and Adam Del Marcel, two brothers out of Philadelphia, called A Shadow That Broke the Light. It was a living art installation and a performance piece that ran for 24 hours, again, at Collar Works Gallery, and it centered around the opioid epidemic. Along with the production on this uh, project, we partnered with the Nopiates Committee of West Sand Lake and the CDPHP Foundation to provide educational resources to the patrons of our performance. We also held a fundraiser for this cause in the Gas Holder Building in Troy. For our patrons, this was an extremely moving experience. The feedback that we received was very special and it challenged us to keep producing this piece of work in different formats when the pandemic hit. 
Uh, one of the most beautiful parts of this production was the paper that you see hung in this production photo was actually uh, made by Dr. Eric Avery, an artist who was came to us through Adam Del Marcel, one of the brothers, who was the other artist on this project. Uh, this paper was made from the clothing of those who have passed uh, from the opioid epidemic. And so every seven minutes, we hung a piece of paper to represent someone passing from an overdose. The last main stage we were able to do before COVID-19 hit uh, was a commissioned work with Diecast of Philadelphia called Yellow, a creative piece based on dark horror and the writing of H.P. Lovecraft. We were able to use the expanse of the Trojan Hotel pictured here on Third Street in Troy, New York, an almost 200-year-old building that up to that point had been abandoned and um, empty for five or six years. And so the hotel became a character again in this piece. Um, and again, the hotel and the location would come to serve a great purpose for us in the future. Here's a production still from Yellow. Our audience moves very close to us in these settings, again, pre-pandemic. Our audience is never seated. They're always on their feet, moving from room to room, seeing story to story, oftentimes hearing overlapping text and overlapping language and breath. It's another production photo from Yellow. That year, we actually received some, some well-welcomed accolades um, through the collaborative which listed us as being one of 2019's pivotal groups uh, to support the arts. We were very happy about that accolade. I'm gonna talk a little bit about training and creation, which is one of the bases of the Troy Foundry Theater. I mentioned earlier our relationship with Collarworks Gallery and how that led to our first artist residency. That was the Elizabeth Murray Artist Residency, of, of course, hosted by Collarworks. It was the first long-term training opportunity uh, that we obtained where we really started to dive into training and creation methodology. We attended that residency with DieCast, and we learned from them um, how to create work in a short amount of time and how to create work efficiently and fast. We worked on writing prompts, we worked on uh, learning about how our bodies interact with each other, how our bodies move, and how we can use text and breath to create content. That was a wonderful experience. These scenes are a mix from the residency at EMAR and a mix from our own training and development and rehearsal process at Troy Foundry. Since launching, we have created our own methodology that we call praxis. The definition of that word is the process by which a theory, lesson, or a skill is enacted, embodied, or realized. We call it praxis because it's the intersection of theory and performance, in our opinion. And so our training, our devising, and our world building methodology has been refined throughout the three years of our existence. It is a performance and dramaturgical training technique that is unique to us and the city of Troy, but it also draws from long established and new and innovating devising practices. Training with some company members all the way in New York City means that we have to get creative when we meet. Uh, our associate artistic director, Katie Pager, you can see here, zooms in with us on her screen often to lead us through training exercises, devising practices. Um, so we really have to get creative when our company spans across different states, especially during COVID-19. This is a video that I'll show of one of our praxis sessions. Um, this is a slight, a, a brief introduction of what things look like when we start to create content and create work. Whenever you're ready. Ah. A blanket, a little doll, a 
sewing machine. Two chairs with faded yellow fabric. Mom's Bible, dad's Bible, all the curtains. Our family portrait, the dog. And this as well is an example of what it might look like as we're creating work. Now we have a saying at Troy Foundry Theater that nothing is precious. We learned that from Brenna Geffers of Diecast. Any of the work that we create could be gone tomorrow, but it's, it's what we learn in the process that helps us to create our work and to work as a unit and as a team, which is important to us. I'm gonna show a few pictures now um, that demonstrate how we get it all done as a extremely small and underfunded nonprofit in the capital region. We have a dedicated team of about 15 individuals and an incredible board of directors that makes Troy Foundry Theater go round. We put massive amounts of time and effort and sweat labor into everything that we do. Um, our artistic team is our creative team, is our production team, um, and especially early on, there was a lot of crossover there, which made things complicated, uh, but we were all good at what we did and got things done. Each company member has a different set of skills that they have tuned into um, something that is useful that they want to present to the company and have developed those skills as we go along. Everyone knows where they're most successful and where they are most needed and we work really hard to make sure that individuals get to um, hone in and express what they're passionate about. Raising money and fundraising was and is and will always continue to be the number one challenge of starting a theater company from the ground up. Developing deep relationships with our community and those people in the community that view our work, those people that make up our community that we serve, is extremely important to us. When you connect with your community and feel the need that they share, um, you're on the right path. And we'll get into what that community need looks like in a little, moment, in a little bit. <laughs> That is a slide of equipment and coils, which we have many of, many equipment and coils. So after Yellow, that first production in the Trojan Hotel, we were lucky enough to catch the eye of the building owner, Jim Scully, where we performed, and he invited us to stay and set up residency in that building. So for the first time, we had a headquarters. It was challenging. We had to get the building fit for inhabitants. We had to get a certificate of occupancy. We had to get a sprinkler inspection, all of the safety needs that were necessary for operating out of that building. But it was a chance to have a home, a chance to have a place to store our equipment, our scenic pieces, a place to have an office, and most importantly, a central location in Troy to more further embed ourselves into the community. That was very important to us. We were able to get one performance and one reading in before everything shut down for COVID-19. <clears throat> Since launching in October of 2017, we have produced over 60 events, all of which were either free or under $25 to attend. Of those 60 events, seven productions were world premiere pieces of theater, 15 were readings of new plays through our Dark Day Monday free reading series, Five were co-productions with other theater companies, local and afar. Three were community workshops and trainings, and the remainder were performance salons, fundraising events, and digital pieces of pandemic theater and social justice art activities. And we're doing all this with a budget less than $50,000 a year. Just let that sink in for a second while I have a sip of water. <clears throat> By the time COVID-19 hits, we have built a bold identity. We are known in the capital region for producing non-traditional, innovative, and visually stunning creations of devised theater from the ground up. 
and we are known as an engaged arts organization that raises attention, attention to social injustice and inequality through the means of our work. The next section we're gonna dive into is COVID-19 and the responsibility of arts organizations during times of political and social chaos. Uh, around March 2020, COVID-19 shut down all theater operations as we know them. Our company cancels all live programming initially scheduled between March and August. We lose thousands of dollars in ticket revenue and community sponsorships and potential grant funding. And we also lose the opportunity to communicate with our community. Our company begins communicating only via Zoom. We tried to figure out what we could do to stay active. What could we do to stay available for people that might need theater and art during a time like this of such isolation. So we began to develop a digital piece of programming called TFTV that explored how we might be able to keep producing during a time where we can't be together or have a live audience. Just a few weeks later, George Floyd is killed and the Black Lives Matter protests begin to take speed. We decide that it's the right thing to do to cancel our piece of digital programming and focus on service and social injustice and inequality. We are invited to create a piece of theater called 846 with the Black Theater Troupe of Upstate New York, inspired by the death of George Floyd. We decide to open the doors of our headquarters to provide a safe haven with supplies and restrooms for the peaceful protesters of the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter March in Troy that drew 11,000 people to our city. We received many messages and threats for our decision to open the doors of our lobby but not allow the police department to enter. And so it was time that Troy Foundry really took a look at who we were in this moment. We were a primarily white theater company. And we decided to make the following public statement as many, many other theater companies decided to make a public statement. We also understood that this statement literally meant nothing unless we followed it with action and a commitment. That's just a scene from the Black Lives Matter protest in Troy. The city began to change in front of our eyes. We began to work with the leaders of Equality for Troy to take action on our statement. With Troy leader and organizer Tashika Medina, Equality for Troy's mission is to combat systemic injustices and racial inequality in the city of Troy, New York and Rensselaer County through community outreach, education, advocacy, and development. We wanted to know how could we compile our resources to meet both of our missions and to make a difference together. Since then, we've partnered with Equality for Troy on several initiatives in the last year in response to community need. Initially, we combined our efforts to combat drug addiction and provide harm reduction in Troy's Barker Park. Since then, our efforts have expanded. Spearheaded by Equality for Troy, we partnered um, with them to create the outdoor Barker Park free store. That store provides clothing and housing goods to those most in needs. We organized the store at the hotel because that's the resource that we have to give. And each Wednesday, the free store is set up in Barker Park for those who need it most. Lockdown is still rampant. 
We decide to create a piece of digital programming called the Living Room Series, where the people from our community, the artists and the musicians that were out of work and suffering could live stream from their homes each Friday and Saturday. This became successful. It was a way for us to pay artists and for our community to have some kind of uh, artistic uh, content and programming and interaction with people from the safety of their homes. By the time August came around and restrictions were lifted, so people were able to gather outside again, we decided we wanted to move our living room series to a live outdoor situation. And that's what you see here, are some scenes from some of the outdoor programming that we were able to put together. We applied for a permit with the city of Troy to utilize the Franklin Alley, which was out backside the Trojan Hotel. And we also had the idea to approach E. Stewart Jones, who owned the parking lot directly next to the hotel. We asked if we could use it when they were, no, when they were not in business, and they willingly agreed. The Trojan Alley series was a way for us to be able to gather our community, to be able to see our community again, and for them to be able to see important things like theater and music that they were truly missing. This is a short clip from one of our alley performances featuring artist The Age. It's all about you, girl. It's all about you. And all the things you do. It's all about you. That was an amazing night, and it was one of the first nights that people were able to gather in a really long time. Uh, music was not the only piece of the programming. We had silent movie nights. We had a magician come <laughs> one afternoon, which was really lovely. Uh, we had open mic nights. We had a bluegrass night. Uh, our open mic night, hosted by Michael Gregg, I'll show a little clip. And so uh, before I move on to the next slide, just one last comment there. Um, the alley and the parking lot was the only thing that saved <laughs> Troy Foundry Theater in 2020. We were able to realign, even though we had to change the way that we produced in a very short amount of time and also adhere to many safety procedures and many safety precautions, and address people at the level of comfort that they were at. That, air, that trial um, was what led us into knowing that we could actually produce a full piece of theater outdoors in that parking lot. And so we decided to produce Models of Perfection. We were so pleased with the success of the Trojan Alley series that we knew that we could get it to work. We knew that it was coming up on cold weather, September, October, so we had to we had to do it quick. The piece was created by our associate artistic director, Katie Pedro, and the play was written to take place on a stoop outdoors in a city centered around characters named brother and sister who had been displaced from their home, and the universe was violently crumbling and disintegrating around them. The challenges to producing this piece of theater were many. We had to make sure that all of our people involved were getting COVID tested weekly. We had to ask that they were quarantining as much as possible. We had temperature checks, we had mask wearing, and we rehearsed outdoors. 
Of course, the production itself took place outdoors, and so the challenges of making a parking lot available for a piece of uh, theater from, the, from nothing was extremely challenging. We had to think about lighting, we had to think about sound, we had to think about electrics, we had to think about audience and how their experience would be, how they would be safe, and how we would keep all of our actors and our technicians and our creatives safe as well, while providing a magical experience. And so all of those things came together in a way that we never could have imagined. We kept our cast to three people. The smallness of the cast was really important for us as far as safety. Pictured here, Inia Bassi Nelson and Angelique Powell in the role of brother and sister in Models of Perfection. The story that they told was beautiful and moving. Now, what is it like to be at a play outdoors in a parking lot in an alleyway? I'll show you a small clip. The last two topics that I have to talk about today are the most important. How do we move ahead in a pandemic world? What can we expect moving forward? The best answer is we don't know. What we do know is that we must be malleable. As arts organizations, we must be willing to change. We must be willing to push ahead. As vaccines become more accessible, theaters may be able to open at a percentage of capacity, but congregating in large spaces will never ever be the same ever again. And we can't expect our audiences to react and respond the same as they did before COVID-19. An entire industry was essentially decimated. What does indoor safety look like? And can we as a small theater company afford to keep up? How can we make our artists and our patrons feel safe and respected as we eventually move forward in a post-COVID world? There's not a lot of answers at this time. <laughs> but what we do know is we have to keep pushing forward. And when I say there are things that plague the American theater, I don't just mean COVID-19. I also mean that the institution of American theater is racist, and that is something that we all need to come up against. In July of 2020, a coalition of theater makers who were black, indigenous, and people of color under the names We See You White American Theater released a list of demands for change in the theater field. This moment and the movement didn't come out of nowhere. It emerged from long-standing frustration among black, indigenous, and people of color who make theater. They released 29 pages of demands that addressed everything from hiring to work conditions to boards and funding. It's only possible after reading 
this list of demands to begin to grasp the full range of what these theater makers have been trying to say to the theater community for years. They have never truly felt welcome in this industry, an industry geared by and run by white theater makers. And that's me, and that is Troy Foundry Theater, that was our company. Many theaters rushed to express their solidarity with this movement. Apologies. But the real question in that moment was, are you willing to commit to real anti-racism work at your theater? Predominantly white institutions exist for one reason, and it's racism. We assessed our own institution in 2020, and that was us. This was Troy Foundry Theater in that moment. We were a theater company with all white leadership. We could have stopped and said to ourselves, that's not us, we're not racist. I was raised to be inclusive and accepting, but the simple fact is, if you're white and you work in theater, you are building upon centuries of racist policies and institutions that have plagued the American theater and theater education since its existence. And it must end, and we can do better. All white theater is not a reflection of the city that we live in in Troy. All white theater is not a reflection of the world that we live in. And so the question that I ask myself and all white theater leaders moving forward is if we're resisting, why are we resisting that? That's a question that theater makers and board leaders and patrons have to grapple with moving forward. I believe that this requires an organization-wide commitment to change in both culture and policy. I think real change requires confession, redesign, investigation, reflection, and the pursuit of growth. And I think the best way to change the culture of an organization is to make sure that it's determined by all involved and to make sure that all involved means all. Not just a committee or not just the board, not just the leadership. This shift should include artists and staff, the people who actually carry the mission. Troy Foundry is a young company, three and a half years old, and I believe that we can successfully break this cycle in the capital region. And it is not the responsibility of BIPOC to teach us about why the American theater is plagued with systemic racism. It is not their responsibility to teach white theater makers how to make and enforce change that demands equality. It is our responsibility to learn. It is our responsibility to make change in our company in our leadership and in our creative teams, and it is our responsibility to share the resources that we have and reach other artists in the community that are already there and already doing the work. I believe it is the, non, the responsibility of a nonprofit theater to reflect the city and the people that it serves in the art and the education and the theater that they present. And without breaking these cycles, art is meaningless and not accessible. And with that, Troy Foundry commits again to this and to making this commitment. I'd like to now open it up for questions. Okay. I have two very different questions here. I'll start with, uh, what advice would you give to students who want to join the theater industry? Hmm, that's a very large, wide, vague question, but I will do my best to address it. Um, if you are currently a student in college, um, I would suggest checking out what resources are available on campus as far as theater and the performing arts. Uh, HVCC has this wonderful uh, resource that we're standing in today, so um, maybe check that out. I would also encourage you to look to your community and see what arts organizations are around that you're interested in, if you're interested in their work. Um, if you're interested in staying local, um, there are lots of opportunities. Check out, of course, Troy Foundry Theater. Check out Illuminate Theater. 
Um, check out Acting with Erin. Um, there are lots of local people in your community doing amazing things, teaching classes, producing work. Uh, get yourself involved, contact somebody. I have a question here. What can theater goers do to support the industry and BIPOC theater professionals? I think this is a, a question that um, a lot of people uh, wince when they hear. Um, asking the question is great, but you should take it upon yourself to do the research and to understand what's missing and what's needed and do that. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? The Capital Region has a robust theater community. Why do you think there are so many small groups rather than combining to pool talents and resources? That's a great question and that is also something that Troy Foundry has been striving to do. Uh, we just actually announced our 2122 company, and within that, we've announced associate artists, uh, Morgan Hayward representing Illuminate Theater, and Christophe Di Maria representing Will Kemp's Players. Um, that is a, an experiment uh, that we are trying this year, committing to those individuals and to their theater companies to combine efforts and resources and talents. So uh, we'll let you know how it goes. As to answer the beginning of the question, I think there are so many, so many smaller groups uh, because everybody has their own version of what they'd like to do and everybody wants to try their own thing. How can college-based theater groups address the same issues you've brought up in terms of equity and racism? I want to reiterate that I am a white woman and I am not um, the expert on this uh, topic. Uh, I can share how I feel as a white theater maker, but um, I should not be the one giving uh, the final word here. So I'm going to say again, if you are a white theater college student, do your research, understand the history, and look to see what you can do to make change. Don't expect someone else to tell you how to solve the problem. Take action. Does Troy Foundry Theater currently partner with students in the area? Um, yes, actually, this year we launched an apprenticeship program. Um, we have two currently from Siena College and our um, potentially one more from Russell Sage. So uh, head on over to our website, troyfoundrytheater.com, under the Education tab, and you can read about that. I think that's it. Um, I know we talked about some tough topics today, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me speak. Uh, best of luck to all of the students and to all of the non-students who tuned in. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you at a Troy Foundry show when it's safe. <laughs>